morning and welcome everybody to worship here at Augusta Heights Baptist Church. I'm so glad to see everybody and to hear but so much chatter. So excited to be here. I'm excited to be here too, but I'm glad to know that, that you are glad to be here as well. Um, especially on this holiday weekend, as you know, this weekend we celebrate the birthday of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his life and his legacy. <laughs> I was getting a little rewritten. Okay, off for all. Just so. Okay, <laughs> so glad to see y'all. Uh, glad you can hear me. I can hear you. Um, but we celebrate the life and legacy, the birthday of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all that he had to say about the church and about nonviolence, about racial equity, about love in action, and about living an authentic faith. We remember that and honor that uh, as we celebrate this weekend. As a reminder, tomorrow is a holiday for our church as well. The office will be closed. Greg will not have his, his other office hours at the Commons tomorrow. Uh, so just a reminder of that. If you're visiting with us, there is a visitor card in the queue back in front of you, hopefully. If you would like to fill that out, we ask that you drop it in one of the offering boxes, either here at the front or at the back of the church after the service. Speaking of these offering boxes, we are still on track with our capital campaign, and we encourage you to give as you are able and willing as we continue to uh, to raise money for our new space. Uh, this space here is wonderful, but we're also renovating it in addition to the space that we just opened a, a couple of months ago. I want to uh, draw your attention to some of the prayer concerns and celebrations in the bulletin. I want you, first of all, to continue to remember James Johnson and David Dryden <coughs> and their family, the loss of James's brother and also Dave's father. You may see in your bulletin there that Taylor and Katie McDavid are expecting a baby in January, but bulletin was printed on Thursday. We actually, it should read baby born in January because they had their baby on Thursday. Hollis Regal McDavid was born Thursday, January. They are all at home, family and baby, resting and doing well, so we celebrate with them. Also want to draw your attention to some of the opportunities in the bulletin to get involved in the life of the church. We're still doing our Why We Are the Way We Are class. We've had a couple of weeks of that class. We still have four to go, so you can drop in and out if you want. I encourage you to come to all the classes that you can, but we've got four left. It's on Sundays at 9.30 in the first room on the right in the new building. So Greg and I have been leading that. We'll continue to do so over the next four Sundays. also want to draw your attention to the Building Hope Weekend. We've been mentioning this for several weeks now. We have about 10 people signed up already. We still have space for others who want who may want to go. This is where we're traveling to Allendale County down in the low country of South Carolina, right near the Georgia border, uh, to assist with light repair and construction projects. No experience needed. If you know how to swing a hammer, or if you don't, you're welcome to attend. So if you want more information on that, then see Greg after the service. Also want to mention that the youth are going on a ski trip in February, so if you've got a middle, middle schooler or a high schooler who's interested in going skiing with us, it will be an overnight trip. We'll go up one evening, stay in a house, and we'll ski the next day and come back that day. If you're interested, if you have a youth in the church who's interested, then see me uh, after church today. We're so glad that you're here, and as we now turn our hearts toward God in worship, I want to invite the choir up as we... Uh, have our son call to worship this morning. Let us worship. Thank you. 
pray. Lord, we express our gratitude for the countless blessings you have bestowed upon us. We are thankful for the transformations, the unity, and the hope that have been kindled among us. Your mercy and love sustain us through life's challenges, and for that, we are truly thankful. As we gather here today, may your blessings continue to shine upon us as we continue your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And let's stand and sing together our opening hymn. It's number 27. All creatures of our God and King will do verses 1 and 3. Let's stand and sing together. Just a minute. They look so good today. 
Welcome, guys. Good morning, good morning. Is everyone good today? Yes, I like that answer. Hopefully everyone's had a great week. It's been a little chilly, hasn't it? Yes, a winter is definitely here. All right, and so are all of our kids. So, yay! All right, today we are going to hear a... Um, a bit of Psalms as our uh, Bible verse today, and I don't want to like be the spoiler who does the Bible verse before the Bible verse. So I'm just going to do a little bitty bit of it. And part of it says, you know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar, you're familiar with my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. So, I was going to kind of talk about that a little bit today and how God knows us thoroughly through and through, our good stuff and our bad stuff, and we don't have to say anything. We don't have to do anything. He just knows it. So, without saying anything, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. So, as I pull something out of my bag, it's going to reveal a little bit about Miss Melody. And it's just a visual, so you get to know a little bit about me without me having to say anything. So, my first thing is this. What do you think that tells you about me? Yes, ma'am. You like plants. I love plants. So... Most of you don't know this, but my children are getting older and they've left me alone. One day you'll do it to your parents. Be very kind because we will cry a lot. And I have worked out an equation that I think it takes about 12 plants to replace a child. <laughs> I have three kids. So do you think I have a lot of plants? This one's not real. My rest of them are all real. I was scared to bring my babies here in case they got hurt. Okay, here's my next one. Mm. What do you think, Lennon? Like oh, no. <laughs> Lennon is wrong. <laughs> do not like coffee, Madeline? Love I love coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Say, my students roll up in my classroom, guys, at 7.30 in the morning. I love coffee. I love coffee. Okay, here is another one. And I don't know if you have to kind of look inside of it to see what this is. So, what do you think that tells you about me, Jack? Love to cook. And I have to have recipes because I'm not the best cook, but I love to cook. Okay, all right. What about ooh, this one? Ooh, it's a book. So, what does that tell you? I love to read and... Here's another one. It's another type of book. I have lots of books up here. So you think I was a teacher or something. All right, so let me open this one. What do you think this kind of book is? I know. It's a notebook. So what else do you think I like to do? I love to write. Poetry is my favorite, but I like to write all kinds of things. And then this is new. I just got this for Christmas. So it's blank, and I'm very excited about it. So this one actually goes with these beautiful things. I'm telling you, some good stocking stuffers were happening at the Powell House. So, what about this one? What do you think? Um, it's because you like drawing. I love to draw. So look at that. Just from some different little things that I pulled out of my bag, y'all just learned a whole lot about Miss um, Melody, right? Some of you knew that if you're at Stone, but some of you didn't. So what I want you to think about is you don't have to pull anything out of a bag. God just automatically knows all the things. And he knows those things, too, that aren't always the best things. Like, I'm not going to pull my bad stuff out of the bag. I don't want y'all to know those kind of things. Okay? But God knows you're good. He knows you're bad. And he loves you. And I just think as we're going out today and into this week, to think about that there's someone out there besides just your parents and your family 
that knows you 100% and loves you completely. And what a beautiful thing that is. If we can all remember that no matter what we do or how we act from day to day, that there's someone that loves us completely, that's a pretty great thing to feel in our hearts. So let's bow our heads really quick and have a little prayer. Dear God, thank you for knowing us so well inside and out. Thank you for loving us no matter what happens on our best days, on our worst days. Dear Lord, thank you for loving us completely. Let us remember that, especially on our bad moments this week, that your love will be with us forever and ever. God's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. As Amanda comes up, uh, just a reminder about our star words. These are words, <clears throat> excuse me, that correspond with the theme of each of our Sunday worship services throughout Epiphany, uh, words meant to guide us and lead us as we reflect on them to see God more fully and to see God all around us. So we'll be hearing testimonies throughout this season each week, and so we are grateful for Amanda Folks, who will be offering uh, and sharing her experience and reflections on body. Good one. Um, morning. So um, most of you know that, or maybe a lot of you know that I'm a yoga teacher. I'm not a public speaker. I'm a yoga teacher. Okay, so it wasn't a surprise to me anyway that I pulled the card, um, the Star Wars body. Um, so I just want to actually guide us through one little thing. Can we do that? Is that okay? Okay. So everybody sit up tall. Yeah. Woof. Yes. Okay. So this is now, now we're good. All right, shoulders up. Back, down, shine your heart. Nice. Now take one hand to your heart, one hand to your belly. Close your eyes. Take a nice full and healthy the nose. Open the jaw and let it go. Nice. All right, let me begin here. Um, so the word body has many different uh, uses. We use the word body in many different ways. We say like our physical body, um, the body of Christ, there's a body of water, there's like the body of a car, um, and then like your hair has body, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so, <clears throat> but I was looking up definitions, and they all have like one main theme, is um, that it's like the main part, or the complete entity, or like the complete structure, okay? So, pause that, I just want to tell you a story, keep that in mind. Um, I s started my... Uh, daily yoga practice. I, I always practiced yoga. I always practiced yoga, but I really started like a dedicated daily practice after I had my third kid because um, I was about to lose it a little bit. Yeah. So that hour that I got in yoga truly was the only quiet hour that I got throughout my day. It really was. Um, and I noticed <clears throat> as I went in there to practice yoga, I would start to feel a little different. Um, I've always had a con I was a dancer when I was little. I was, had a connection to like movement and the body um, and music. Um, but so I noticed as I practiced, I would feel more open and I would start to um, be more connected not only with myself, um, but as a Christian to God too, right? I, um, so I started developing like this meditation this like habit of reading a verse or praying or doing something like that before I went into practice yoga. So as that developed, um, uh, I just got in tune with my body opening it up and being able to hear God speak to me in that way, right? So um, uh, as Melody said earlier, like, God is with us. He's within our body. He's with in everything that we do. There's no escaping that. So right now, as we just took a big inhale, we did that together with God, and we exhaled with God, right? We sat up straight, and um, we're in line with God. Uh, so here's, here's what I invite you to do. 
Um, as you exercise, as you breathe, as you meditate, as you do yoga, whatever it may be, know that that you're doing that within within the spirit of God, right? Um, we can stay. Here's here's something that we can think about as we do these things. We can stay in the truth and comfort that God knows us in and out better than we know ourselves. So if we just get on the mat, if we just get, you know, walking, if we just get meditating, stretching, anything, um, God is with us and he knows what we need. And then we invite God into our breath, into our movement, into our yoga practice, our exercise routine, routine, because um, he's not only with us, he's in us. Um, So I invite that, uh, invite him into your space so that we can feel closer to God and feel him as we move. So... (laughs) Can we do this exercise one more time? Sit up straight. You guys all lost it as I talk. (laughs) Shoulders up, back down, shine your heart. Allow God to be in your heart. One hand, one hand to the heart, one hand to the belly. And as you breathe, we'll take a mantra. A mantra is just words that you say when you breathe. So you can think to yourself on your inhale, I invite God in on your exhale. Let's stand and sing together now that we are loose and relaxed uh, as the body of Christ. Hymn number 388, Our God Has Made Us One. Search me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind, and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book, <clears throat> in your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we continue in worship with our theme, Body, 
two readings I want to share with you. Uh, one a poetic reading from Emily Dickinson and one reading from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s book, um, Strength to Love, from 1963. So first, from Emily Dickinson. I'm afraid to own a body, it's called. I'm afraid to own a body. I'm afraid to own a soul. Profound, precarious property, possession, not optional. Double estate, entailed at pleasure upon an unsuspecting heir. Duke in a moment of deathlessness, and God for a frontier. And now a reading from my favorite preacher from the 20th century, Martin Luther King. There are some who still find the cross a stumbling block, and others consider it foolishness, but I'm more convinced than ever before that it is the power of God unto social and individual salvation. So, like the Apostle Paul, I can now humbly yet proudly say, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The suffering and agonizing moments through which I have passed over the last few years have also drawn me closer to God. More than ever before, I am convinced of the reality of a personal God. But in the past, the idea of a personal God was little more than a metaphysical category that I found theologically and philosophically satisfying. Now, it is a living reality that has been validated in the experiences of everyday life. God has been profoundly real to me in recent years. In the midst of outer dangers, I have felt inner calm. In the midst of lonely days and dreary nights, I have heard an inner voice saying, Lo, I will be with you. When the chains of fear and the manacles of frustration have all but stymied my efforts, I have felt the power of God transforming the fatigue of despair into the buoyancy of hope. I'm convinced that the universe is under the control of a loving purpose and that in the struggle for righteousness, humanity has cosmic companionship. And so may each of us feel the power of God transforming our fatigue of despair into the buoyancy of hope, too. My Christian ethics professor and one of my mentors, James Dunn, once began one of our seminary classes with a, shall we say, memorable prayer. In offering his gratitude to God for the people in our lives, he said, Lord, we thank you for all of your good gifts, but especially those that come to us in flesh packages. (laughs) And I lost it. I got such a case of the church giggles over that way he phrased it that I could barely catch my breath to utter an amen at the end. Maybe because that kind of body talk seems so out of context for a seminary class, for something that was supposed to be about our faith. Of course, we hear and see and talk about bodies all the time in our society, in our culture. The latest diets and the newest workout trends, anti-aging and age-reversing skincare products, and models wearing the trendiest clothes over that skin. The fat-free, low-cal, no-sugar, all-natural, non-GMO, free-range foods that are supposed to be the very best for us. And pharmaceutical commercials that we see on TV promising to cure whatever ails you if you can survive the litany of side effects that they tell you about as a middle-aged couple sits in bathtubs outside overlooking the sunset. It's a real commercial. In our culture, we are surrounded with body talk. Except, it seems, in the church. At least not in most churches. Maybe because it's, maybe it's because we've gotten so focused on this 20th century evangelical idea of saving souls that we've thrown the body out with the bathwater, so to speak. Maybe the Greek dualism that has influenced historical theology has divided our understandings of spirit and flesh, of non-matter and divinity and matter and humanity into mutually exclusive categories. Or maybe our bodies are just too earthy and too messy for our liking. 
I mean, how can divinity have anything to do with this? With what Emily Dickinson called profound, precarious property. I've been told and have it on good authority that the angels who were present during creation debated where exactly to put the divine image. Where could they place something so precious and powerful so that it could be protected and safe and hidden? One said, let's put it at the bottom of the sea where no one will ever find it. No, another one said, we should put it at the top of the very highest mountain so that nobody could ever scale it. No one could ever get to it. They kept spitballing one idea after another. None of them felt quite right until finally one of them said, why don't we hide the divine image in each and every human being? That's the last place that we'll ever put it. And that's where it has resided ever since. Fred Craddock once said that when God looked upon creation, and particularly on human beings, God said, I'm proud of the elephant. The sloths are cool. The horse is good. The dog is nice. And I do love those llamas. But the one I formed from the dust, the one that is exactly like me, is this one. Of course, we know we're not exactly like God. In Genesis, we read that God created humanity in God's own image. But the root of that Hebrew word means shade or shadow, so they're not exactly the same, but they are connected. Peter Marty compares it to a child playing outside on a sunny day, trying to get away from their shadow. Maybe they try to you know, step on it and scrape it off of their foot. Maybe they try and run away faster and faster, trying to get away from it and leave it behind. But in the end, they realize there's nothing they can do to get rid of it. Because no matter what, it is intimately and inextricably connected to its source. However imperfect we may be, in every human being, in every human body, God's image lives. God's own self entered the world in just such a body, in the person of Jesus, and throughout his life, he welcomed children into his arms and onto his lap. He touched lepers and healed the sick. He filled the empty stomachs of hungry people. He laid hands on eyes and ears and heads, making cataracts dissolve and eardrums ring again. And yet, as much as we may speak of God's image in humankind, in God's embodied presence in the person of Jesus, and Jesus' own care for bodies, as much as we may read scriptures like the one we just heard of the God who formed us and made us beautifully and wonderfully, sometimes, often, we still don't see bodies as sacred. Not even our own, maybe especially not our own. Whether intentionally or unintentionally, we are often the worst offenders in the mistreatment of bodies. I mean, be honest, when's the last time you looked in a mirror and didn't see something you wanted to change? Like the zit that appeared on my face this morning. <laughs> Wishing we had a few less pounds or wrinkles, the shape of our nose, the size of our nose, <laughs> seeing any line or spot or scar as bad, unworthy, Would it have made a difference if Jesus had acne? If he had a bad knee? If he was double-jointed? If his body was in any way less than perfect? Would it have made him any less than Christ? Or, you know, when we start, when we have a desire to express our God-given sexuality, what begins as that in a healthy way can devolve into patterns of pleasure-seeking and shame-fleeing. Or what begins as a bag of chips binge-eaten in despair, or a glass of wine after a long day, or a painkiller taken to take the edge off, or an increasingly rigid exercise routine left unchecked and unquestioned can become a full-blown obsession or addiction. 
And then there are the things beyond our control, injury and aging, disease and death that lead to the suffering of our embodied selves. But there's also things very much in our control. Things that don't just affect our bodies, either. My dear friend Scott Dickinson pastored the First Baptist Church of Christ in Macon, Georgia. And part of the church's work around racial justice involved digging into their history and examining the church's relationship with the slave trade and slave ownership in Macon. The church was founded in 1826 by six families, five of whom owned human beings of African descent. As they researched more, they discovered that the original church sanctuary, once called a Gem of Macon, was financed primarily through the sale of 20 enslaved persons by one of the prominent families in the church. And because they know that the church at that time, the congregation at that time, was made up of both black enslaved peoples and their white slave owners, that means the church was funded through the sale of some of its own members' bodies. In the body of Christ, the church was bankrolled by selling the bodies of its members. And by the way, this story is not an exception to the rule when it comes to historic churches in the South. Tomorrow, we will celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And it might be tempting to remember him as someone who simply wanted to change hearts and minds, to transform the way people thought or felt. But his God was much more than a metaphysical category, as we heard Eric read. King's God, our God, is a living reality, validated in the experiences of everyday people. Yes, Dr. King wanted to change hearts and minds, but only so that he could change the experiences of black bodies in everyday life. Bodies that were excluded from certain spaces, that were beaten with clubs and attacked with dogs and sprayed with fire hoses. Bodies that were mutilated, swinging in the southern breeze, that strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. And not all that different from the one we worship who hung from a cross. Even today, we only have to glance at our news feed or our headlines to see bodies that are ignored or excluded, maimed or murdered. Black and brown bodies that are still seen as suspect, immigrant bodies that are labeled as illegal, elderly bodies that are dismissed and discarded. Female bodies that are controlled and regulated. Trans bodies are told they're unnatural. Children's bodies are over-sexualized. Obese bodies are shamed. So-called disabled bodies are devalued. And poor bodies suffer and die more than most because they don't have adequate care. And yet, all bear the divine imprint. All are fearfully and wonderfully and beautifully made. God became incarnate as one of us with a body. Jesus himself healed and honored bodies, and for us to do the same, for our own and for others, is a thoroughly faithful act. Because each and every one of us is fearfully and wonderfully made, intricately woven together by the God who created us and knows us fully and loves us wholly. Nobody, no body, was created without the image of God within. Which means no body is beyond the reach of God's transforming love and grace. Matthew Sanford knows this better than most, I think. Sanford is a brilliant yoga teacher. You ought to look him up if you don't know him already. Has one of the most vibrant, integrated bodies uh, of anyone that you'll ever meet which might surprise you when you find out that he's been in a wheelchair for 30 years after a car accident left him paralyzed from the waist down. And for 20 of those years, he took the advice of therapists and physicians who told him to beef up his upper body and just forget about his legs. But yoga helped him to reclaim, we might even say, 
redeem the wholeness, the completeness, the entirety of his body. It helped him insist that even though he could not be cured, he could experience healing. So Sanford has become an innovator of adaptive yoga for people who have physical disabilities, for veterans, for young women with anorexia, you name it. And in doing so, he has helped people, and these are his words, to have compassion for the grace of our bodies. And he says he's never known anyone to become more at home in their own body with all of its flaws and with all of its grace without becoming more compassionate towards others and towards all of life. So I wonder what that would look like for us, for you. What would it look like to be more at home in your own body, which bears nothing less than the very image of God? And in doing so, to become more compassionate towards others and towards all of life, too. Maybe you could set aside and stop any way that you are harming it through an unhealthy habit or with some kind of lack of action or even with your thoughts or your words about yourself and your body. Perhaps you could find new ways to connect with God through your body, as Amanda suggested. Maybe instead of hurrying through bathing and dressing and nourishing and caregiving and exerting and resting, you could find ways to pray through each one giving thanks for the capacities we have for what our bodies can do, listening to them as they tell us more of who we are. Maybe you can start, maybe we can start by simply becoming more aware of and connected to our bodies. So if you would, humor me for a moment, more than you typically do, at least. I'd like to lead us in a type of body prayer connecting with our bodies and with the image and presence of God in them. And if this feels a little too hokey for you, too bad. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Follow along anyway. If nothing else, it's very relaxing. So start by getting as comfortable as you can in your seats. Place your feet on the floor. Back straight, but not stiff. You can rest your hands on your lap or on your thighs or comfortably by your side, arms relaxed. Some of you are already closing your eyes, feel free to do that, or you can keep them open with a soft gaze looking at some point in front of you. And take a few slow, deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. Feel your lungs and chest expand on the inhale and release on the exhale. Imagine it is the breath of God coming into your body as you release your anxieties, your worries. Now bring your attention to your feet. Feel the ground underneath them. As you continue to breathe deeply, imagine your breath going in and all the way down through your torso and your legs, all the way to your toes as you inhale, and then coming back up and out as you exhale. Feel your feet on the floor, maybe wiggle your toes a little bit, feeling them against your shoe. Now turn your attention to your ankles and your calves, up through your legs to your thighs. Notice what you feel in them. Maybe they're a little sore or stiff, uncomfortable. Just notice, no judgment. Feel how your legs are sitting. You can maybe even tense them one muscle at a time and then release it as you continue to breathe deeply. If your mind begins to wander, just notice that and then bring your attention back to your body. As you inhale and then exhale again, allow your awareness to move to the sensations in your lower back, in your pelvis. Feel the weight of your body in your seat. Slowly move your attention upwards to your mid and upper back. Notice the sensations here. How it's touching the furniture you sit on, the temperature, the tightness or the soreness. 
Keep breathing deeply, and each time you exhale, try to release the muscles a little bit more. And let gravity do its work. Anchoring you to the ground. To the earth from which we were all created. As you continue to breathe, bring your awareness to your stomach and your chest. Notice the feel of your clothes against your skin. Notice your heartbeat. Notice how your chest rises and falls as you inhale and exhale. On your next breath, shift the focus to your hands and your fingertips. You can clench them and release them with each breath, almost as if you are breathing through them. And you can bring awareness to your arms. Let them fall heavily by your side or on your lap. Shift your focus to your shoulders and your neck. Be present with the sensations here. If you're holding any tension, if it feels tight. As your shoulders rise with each breath, as you exhale, relax them further into the fall of gravity. As you continue to breathe deeply, direct your attention to your head and your face. Notice the movement of the air through your nostrils and your mouth. As you breathe, try to relax each muscle in your face. And now let your attention expand to your entire body. All of it, all together. Take one last deep breath and exhale fully as you open your eyes and return to the present moment. And as you do, give thanks for the breath and the heartbeat that sustains our very lives, for the feet that carry us to places of service and worship and community and connection. For the legs that support you, allowing you to stand up in praise or even in protest. For the back and the shoulders that carry heavy burdens, whether it's packs of shingles or two-by-fours or the emotional weight of a friend's sorrow. For the belly and the chest that allow our hearts to be open to those who suffer to enjoy food shared around the table. For the head and the mind that allows us to comprehend, at least in part, the purposes and the promises and the love of God, and the hands that allow us to reach out and share that love with others. And give thanks for the eyes that allow us to see the beauty and the presence of God within each and every one of us. Even us. Even you. Now, I don't expect this small moment of practice to completely change how we see and interact with and live in our bodies. But perhaps it will help us to move towards offering our bodies and our very lives as a living sacrifice, in the words of the Apostle Paul. Sensing God's presence within them, within us, and then being able to use our bodies in whatever way we can for the sake of God's purposes, to bring about mercy and justice, healing and wholeness, to share and show God's love and grace to a hurting and broken world, just as Jesus did. Filled with the presence of God, God's purposes at work through him, God's promises embodied in him. Jesus healed bodies held captive by disease and infirmity. He honored the bodies of women, of children, of lepers and outcasts. He offered his own body to be broken, even to be killed, so that we might know in our bodies and in all of life and even in death, God is with us, even with us especially 
in our wonderful and wounded, beautiful and broken bodies. As we turn to a time of communion, we remember that Jesus' body was broken. In fact, we remember that on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and he blessed it, and then he broke it, and then he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the love of God in Christ and in his life and death and resurrection. Let us pray. At this table, holy God, we celebrate with thanksgiving the saving acts and presence of Christ. By his ministry among the poor and the forgotten, you teach us your gracious compassion. By his death on the cross, you show your suffering love. By his resurrection from the silent tomb, you display your glorious power. And by his promise to return, you offer us endless hope. Send the power of your Holy Spirit now here on us, gathered here out of love for you and on these gifts. And may the Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in service to all the world. In his name we pray. Amen. This is an open table. For we all bear the image of God within us. And so if this would be a meaningful act of worship for you, you are welcome. It is Christ's table, not ours. And Jesus ate with everyone. There is wine on the right as you come up, juice on the left. You can take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, eat, and return to your seat by way of the outside table, uh, outside aisles. The table is open, so come and share in the feast.
friends, each and every one of us is one of those beautiful things, fearfully and wonderfully made. If you have sensed the presence of God in your own life, at work, within you, or have sensed that presence in the body of Christ here at Augusta Heights, we encourage you to respond, to walk alongside you through life, and for you to walk alongside us as we seek to consecrate our lives, even our bodies, that we may better serve others, serve God, and draw closer to God and closer to one another. So that is the invitation to you today as we stand and sing our closing hymn. It's number 277, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated. Let's stand and sing together. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them be imposed on my love at the Y'all would be seated for gen- Whoa. That communion bread got stuck in my, my throat, apparently. Uh, you got the idea. Be seated for just a moment. I know I'm good. I know we are uh, just a few minutes over, but this is the best reason to go a little bit late on a service. So I'd like to uh, introduce to you, we have a couple new folks joining us today. So first of all, Luke Headley, if you'll come up. And uh, right here, Luke has been visiting with us for a number of months and uh, is looking to make this his church home. He has sensed God's presence here in the body of Christ at Augusta Heights. And so if you will welcome him and receive him gladly into our fellowship, if you will pledge to walk alongside him in his journey of faith as he walks alongside us in ours together, will you please affirm that by saying, Amen. Amen. We're so glad that you are here. And then, David, if you'll come on up, too. This is David Ralston. Uh, you have probably seen him, definitely heard him. Uh, he is. He has been... Uh, yeah, I know, I had to get that in. No, that's um, fine. He has uh, been getting more and more involved in our church, in our, uh, of course, worship and music ministry, um, but making so many connections with so many of you has really found a home here. In fact, he called me yesterday and said, I've already requested my letter of membership for my old church. It'll be on the way soon. So uh, we are so excited that he is so excited. And if you will also do the same to pledge to walk alongside him in his journey of faith, even as he comes to walk alongside us, will you please affirm that by saying, Amen. Amen. Glory, jalapeno. (laughs) We are so glad that both of y'all are here. Um, We'll get a picture of y'all in a little bit, but um, I hope that uh, that y'all will come forward. The rest of y'all will uh, come up and share your words of encouragement, of support, of welcome. Introduce yourselves if you haven't already had a chance to, uh, but we are just so glad to add to the body of Christ here at Augusta Heights, even as each of us seeks to serve God and fulfill God's purposes and promises through our lives in our bodies. So as we go to join with the work of God in our world, we pray that God would give us grace. Grace never to sell ourselves short. Grace to risk something big or something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take our minds and think through them. May God take our lips and speak through them. 
May God take our hands and work through them. And may God take our hearts and set them on fire this day, every day, and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.